1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and our brother, <laughs> Sosthenes, got to get that right, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to God, my God, always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, good morning. It is a joy to start a new endeavor, if the Lord gives us time, to uh, work through another book of the Bible, and we're going to go, Lord willing, verse by verse, and by comparison, last time I preached, we covered six chapters. We're going to get through two verses, I think, this morning. Uh, but really setting the stage for this book, and uh, I think you'll see as time goes uh, why it's so important as we cover this important book about the church, 1 Corinthians. With That's enough introduction. Let's pray once more for His help as we particularly turn to His Word. Heavenly Father, we come to You because You've given us this Word, and we know that Your law is perfect. It converts the soul. It's a sure testimony, and it gives wisdom to the unlearned and enlightens the eyes. So we humbly just ask you, because you are just boundless in your goodness, would you enlighten our blind intellect by your Holy Spirit so we'd truly understand and profess your law and live according to it? Because it's pleased you, most merciful Father, to reveal these kind of mysteries of your will only to the little ones. And since you look to him alone who is of a humble and contrite spirit, who has reverence for your word, just grant us that, that humble spirit. Keep us from all fleshly wisdom, which is enmity against you. Bring to the right way those who stray from the truth, so that we all may unanimously serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. We ask this from you, most merciful Father, but only in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You call this a church? Such a statement typically would rise from someone whose expectations, obviously, were woefully disappointed. You call this a church? And perhaps if it's maybe in your past, maybe you're someone who grew up in a church that was, you know, kind of the, the smells and bells type church. I think we call that often a high church, a very liturgical church, robes, incense, wrote prayers. And if that's what you experience or expect church to be, you come into a place like this. I don't know, what do we call ourselves? Low church? Uh, that might not seem much like church at all. Or conversely, as I came to Christ as a high school student in Southern California, it was a very contemporary environment. And you could say that the music was lively, uh, that was worship. And uh, so that was in high school, and then I showed up in college at Grace Community Church where John MacArthur pastors, and I yawned through the worship songs. I might as well have said in my heart, I know I did, you call this a church? You call this worship? The songs are old. The people hardly sing. The people are old. There seems so little emotion. This is church? This is worship? In either case, though, of course, we see working both ways, the external forms on the outside can't really tell you what's a true church. There may be different styles of genuine churches. 
where the gospel is rightly preached and where Jesus is rightly worshiped and the ordinances are rightly practiced, some are going to have smells and bells, some are going to have guitars and drums, some are going to have robes and collars, and some are going to have, at least like I did, corduroy shorts and flip-flops in the middle, late 90s. But you got to get beyond the facade, you got to get beyond the outside, and you got to get inside. You got to look at the heart. What makes these people or this group a church or not? What makes it of genuine worship? Okay. So we've opened the door, and now we're going into this group called a church. And you look inside, and then you find out we well, you know what they're known for? They're known for being rather divisive. I mean, sadly, our church is known for this. The joke is, but it's happened, dividing over color of carpets. Oh, this assembly in particular, they're known for their factions. They're known for their cliques. They're known for having favorites. And each little group thought they were better Christians than the other ones next door. Would you call that a church? Oh, and by the way, people are splitting up. They're suing one another for all they can get. Would you call that a church? Or how about even some of the members are frequenting things like brothels and other seedy places. They're known in the community. They're known in the community. The pagan world looks at them and goes, they're known for sexual deviancy. Would you call that a church? Oh, and by the way, they are gluttonous, selfish, brash. They don't even take care of their own. Would you call that a church? Well, to maybe our surprise, Paul does. All of that could well describe the church at Corinth. It may not be a healthy church, to be sure. That's why he has to write this letter, right? But it is a church. And we'll see, even despite all of their failings and foibles and mess-ups, Paul's thankful for them. He thanks God for Christ's work in them, as imperfect as it might seem. Because as he writes this letter, again, if the Lord gives us time, he's going to point out a number of problems among them. And he's going to be calling them, you got to change. Christ's people change. This is what actually defines us as a true Christians. This is what defines us as a true church. Not being perfect, but being always reforming by the word of God, always repenting. And so he's going to be calling them, you got to change. You got to repent. But to prepare them for that, and whatever the Lord is preparing us in the ways we need to repent, as, as a church perhaps, but also even just as individuals, as he's preparing us to change and us to repent, you got to go back to the start. And that's what Paul does here for the Corinthians. He goes back to, you got to first know who you are. You got to go back to, as we often talk about, you got to go to your identity. Who does God say you are in the gospel? You got to drill down there. You got to remember who you are, what the gospel has made you to be. Because Paul understands, because that's where he begins. You got to start there because the more you realize that, that where you stand with God because of Christ, and then it's all by grace, but where you stand with God first, who he's made you to be, the more you understand that, the more you'll be moved to live like it. So you got to go back to the beginning. And so, as he is preparing in this letter too, I mean, as I'm going to put it later, he's going to give them a spiritual spanking in this letter, okay? But to get there, before he's ready to give them the spanking, so to speak, he's establishing them in the truth of the gospel about who they are in Jesus. And that's what we need to do as we prepare, and that's what he does here for us. So you need to take courage in how Christ has favored you. That's what we're going to see in these opening verses, verses 1 to 9 here in chapter 1 over the next two weeks, Lord willing, is to see, hey, He's favored us so much. He's given us such a blessing in Christ. It is such a mercy. And we'll also see, as we'll study this morning, that doesn't change even as we mess up. But as we see that mercy, that doesn't mean we go abuse it. We take in that favor He's given us so we can be confronted and so we can change. And be those people he's called us to be. All right, so we're going to look at, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to see three ways that the, the Lord has given us this favored calling, but we're just looking at the first one today, this morning. And so this favored calling he's given us is we need to see how he sees us. You need to see how God sees you in Christ. And when you see that, you'll see that his favor is more than abundant than you understood. 
Because again, Paul's going to get to some nitty-gritty issues. He's going to get to say some things uh, about this Corinthian church. Frankly, they're not going to want to hear. He's going to find faults in them. He's going to be bringing out how they're compromising the gospel and their relationship with God. But before he can get there, he's drilling down on the objective, unchangeable good news of the gospel so they don't despair. So they don't think that they have been lost with God because there's so many sins that are being brought to their mind, but he's beginning and grounding them first who they are and who are they. And so we're going to look at four aspects this morning about who we are as the people of God. And the first is this, is that we are a commanded people. That is to say, we are a people under authority. We are people under the authority of God and under the authority of His Word and the authority here of the Apostle Paul as he writes this letter. And this is a great favor to us. This is a mercy that we would be called the people of God under the authority of God. And so that's where Paul begins as he opens the book, just frankly there in verse 1, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. And right away, as he opens the book, he's bringing great significance and weight to this letter. And that's going to be needed, again, to stress the importance of what's being said. And you understand this because the Corinthians, they're not going to want to hear a lot of this. I've already said that. They're not going to to hear the criticism. It's going to be tough to listen to what he's going to bring out. But they need to listen. They need to be confronted. Now, for us, some criticism comes your way. Somebody says something about you you don't like to hear. You know, we have all kinds of reasons to make excuses for it or to not listen or to not change. Maybe chief among them is, "Ah, they don't really know me. Uh, They don't really know my situation. They don't really know what it's like. Um, you know, as they say, take it with a grain of salt, but pff, throw it aside. What do they know, really, is how we often think about it. Well, you can't do that here. The Corinthians surely can't do that because Paul has been called by God to say these things. He's been set apart by the Almighty with that authority as their shepherd, the shepherd of their souls, particularly those brothers and sisters here in Corinth. Because if you go back to Acts chapter 18, we discover that Paul, he started this church. So if anybody was their apostle, it was the apostle Paul. So three years, let's put it this way, he wrote this letter, but three years earlier is when he was in Corinth and founding the church there. And it began as he showed up in town, he connected with some other tent makers who were Christians, Priscilla and Aquila, and he preached the gospel in the synagogue until they kicked Paul out, right? Right? And then Paul, all discouraged and downtrodden, he just went next door in some guy's house and preached the gospel every day for another 18 months. I don't think he was too deterred or discouraged from his mission. He was there to testify to Jesus Christ. And he did it for a long time. The point is, for Paul, he was there 18 months. And for Paul, that was a long time. He didn't usually stay too much. He was a gospel trailblazer, but he rooted there to send the gospel out. The point being, the Corinthians, they knew Paul. They were well acquainted with him. Again, if anybody was the apostle to these people, it was obviously the apostle Paul. And so he comes bringing that authority, and they would need to remember that because, again, to put it this way, he's coming to write about mm, a number of deficient areas that need immediate improvement. And best we can tell, Paul, when he writes this letter, he is in the town of Ephesus when he pens this letter, and he's not alone. And he mentions one of the brothers with him because that will carry even more authority as well, and it's this fella Sosthenes. He comes, his name's on here, backing up this message. Now, who's Sosthenes? He's mentioned one other time, it's in the book of Acts, and he is the former ruler of the synagogue in Corinth. Now, it's interesting, when Paul first goes to Corinth, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, converts and becomes a Christian. And then Paul is kind of wrangling with this guy, Sosthenes, for the remainder of his ministry there in Corinth until at the very end, the Jews have had it. And so what do they do? They seize Paul, they bring him before the Corinthian governor, and they start telling the Corinthian governor, you need to punish and put this guy Paul in prison. But the Corinthian governor, he doesn't want to hear anything about it. He's like, this is a Jewish question. This has nothing to do with Roman law. You see to it. 
So they weren't going to do anything about Paul. And the Jews were really frustrated at this. And so they took it out on their leader, Sosthenes. And they publicly beat him. And the Romans did nothing about it. So this guy, Sosthenes, at one time was the leader of the Jews in Corinth and was publicly beaten because his attack against the Christians was ineffective. But now things have changed, haven't they? He's now brother Sosthenes. He's followed Paul seemingly to Ephesus. I don't know, maybe it was initially to persecute him, but now he's now a believer in this church that he opposed. So he's come to faith, and he's a very public figure that the Jews that were in Corinth, they would be familiar with, they would know him. And more than this, as it ties to this context here, Sosthenes was somebody, he knows what it's like to be publicly spanked or literally beaten. He knows what it's like to be publicly shamed and to turn from it and to walk in the truth. And even that is setting up an example. Corinthians, get ready to follow this. Because again, in Corinth, they're about to get a spiritual spanking from the Apostle Paul. And it's going to hurt. It's going to sting. That's what discipline does. I appreciate the book of Hebrews, right? It's just honest. It says, discipline, it hurts. It's not pleasant. And it's not supposed to be. There's a shame and a sorrow to it, even as we administer it to our kids. It's true. But it's for our good. It's for our good. The book of Proverbs talks about it. If you love, you will do that as a parent. But the context for that kind of confrontation, the context for that kind of discipline, even with the shame that's tied to it, comes from first a solid relationship and founding, do you see? Because here's what happens. Even in the family relationship, you get this. No matter how much trouble your kid gets in, no matter how much discipline they have to receive, it never changes that kid's identity. It never makes them not your kid. Though you might all feel like it, time here and there, right? But actually, isn't it? precisely because they're your child. That's why you love him so and you won't let him go his own way and you're going to step in to correct, to warn, to rebuke. But even as you do that time and time again, it never changes how they're actually yours and you love them so. That's what Paul's saying here. God's about to give you some spiritual discipline. But it's because you're his. You're people under the authority of the gospel He owns you. He's caring for you. It doesn't change who you are. And actually, because he cares for you, he's not going to let you keep going your own way. It doesn't change your love by God and cared for by him, namely through these messengers, Paul and Sosthenes. So that's the first thing. You got to see who you are, that kind of blessing you have, your people under the authority, the caring authority of God to have you walk in the right way. Second, you need to see that you are a church of God. This is a great favor that God would be associated with you. It's a marvelous mercy. So Paul, as he writes this letter, it's a typical letter of the ancient first century. That is, you don't sign it at the bottom who the writer is. You put it in the very front, Paul, called by the will of God, verse 1. And then you immediately go to who you're writing to. So that's where we're at in verse 2. And how he describes them is so key here. So he addresses them like this. He calls them the church of God. Let's look at this. Verse 2. To the church of God, that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, and we'll pick up more later. But let's just pick up this first. He calls them the church of God, but that is in Corinth. So here, right away, Paul's holding out for us a couple really important truths. In the first place, you have reference to what theologians call the church universal or the universal church. And what is this? This is all the believers all over the world that have rallied and gathered in faith to worship Jesus as their Savior. So understand, this universal church, the church of God on the earth, it's very real. But it's a spiritual idea. That is, nobody's ever seen it in full, right? There's never been a time where the whole church universal has gathered in one place on earth. Because the membership roles of Church Universal comprise all believers everywhere. In that sense, the Church Universal is invisible. But that does not mean you cannot experience the true Church of God. Well, how does that happen? You experience God's true Church, but in the partial, local, 
tangible ways, which is the local church. The local church is the manifestation of the universal church, but in small. You're seeing part of it. And that's why he puts it like this, the church of God that is in Corinth, right? This is the manifestation of the universal church, but here, located in Corinth. And this is what marked the Corinthians out from the world as the church of God. They gathered together. They assembled. They rallied together. That's what church is. It's a, that's what the word means, literally. It's an assembly. It's the assembling of people around Jesus Christ to worship Him. And that's exactly what the Corinthians literally did. Let me just give you a couple verses because they'll come up later in our study. But 1 Corinthians 11, verse 18, Paul writes, For in the first place, when you come together as a church. That's what you do. That's what churches do. You get together. Verse 20 of that chapter, when you come together. Again, the idea is you gather together. Chapter 14, verse 23, if therefore the whole church comes together, because that's what churches do, they assemble. Verse 26 of chapter 14, what then, brothers, when you come together, see, Each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. But this is what shows to the world who they are. This is what identifies them as the church of God. They assemble together in space and time around to worship Jesus Christ. So what this means, at the least, if you are a Christian, you have to be a gatherer. See this? Christians are churchmen. They are gatherers, not invisible wanderers. Now, but in this sense, too, this means that the church is very localized. It's very tangible. And that means also, depending where it's located, it's going to have unique, tangible challenges to them. Because we are to be a witness to the onlooking world wherever we are. And that onlooking world, wherever that is, has its own context and its own temptations, and Corinth certainly had those. And namely, it seems like the issue for the Christians in Corinth is they were being very tempted to adopt the Corinthian, that is the secular Corinthian's worldview and values, and they were totally infiltrating into the church. And this all shows itself in the various kind of errors that Paul is going to confront them on. Because you really see them in the Corinthian people first, and they've crept their way right into the church. So let me tell you a little bit about this city in Corinth. The city of Corinth was a prosperous and populous Roman city, really the most prestigious and desirous city uh, east of Italy in the whole Roman Empire. And you got to understand the Romans, at one time they destroyed this city, Corinth, but then they rather rebuilt it themselves in 44 B.C., so, you know, a little over 100 years before Paul would write this book. And it was in a very strategic location between two seas, so it, was an, it ends up easily becoming another affluent economic center. What's the point, though, that it got raised and then it's being rebuilt? It was kind of a restart for the whole city. Like, if you can imagine, in a way, the way the Americans settled the West, you know, it was the Wild West, People were settlers. They claimed land and so forth. People wanted a new start. In a way, Corinth 2.0 was like that. People were coming in, fighting for opportunities, looking for financial and social mobility and opportunity. That's why they came back to Corinth. And so what this means, you have all these different peoples, these kind of clubs and associations vying for belonging, vying for the resources there. Yeah, this resorted in a tribalism. The whole society was very divided and factious. You would flaunt your wealth to get people onto your side, to have influence. Wealth was very much a status symbol. You can think of favoritism, greed were a part of this. Orders and rhetoric were prized and pursued and valued, like, like how we do in our own day, to have influencers putting forward our initiatives or just in advertising, celebrity endorsements, same kind of thing. You know what was going on in Corinth? It's what goes on today. Good talk and good looks get you places, at least in the world system. It's very true in Corinth, and it's becoming true in the church, fortunately. Furthermore, there was just the general sexual promiscuity of the Roman world. It still dominated Corinth, and we'll touch more on that, but such that 
In Corinth, a Corinthian girl was another name for a prostitute. Now, what's particularly unique for the church at Corinth that I think is distinct from other churches that we see in the New Testament right to? Okay, you can think about the Thessalonians. They were persecuted almost immediately. So they were seen as something different and pursued and persecuted as something different, but not the Corinthians. They were just another club. They were just another association that people didn't really mind one way or another. So they're being tempted to fit in, to adopt those values. In In a way, it's like the Corinthians, they didn't really care what your religion was. As long as you didn't bother them about it. Right? I mean, how many times have you interacted with somebody over the gospel? Maybe it's family members, so people that otherwise love and care for you, or you're just out on the street talking with people. And generally, I find people are, that I interact with are mostly courteous about it, and they'll say something like, I'm so happy for you, Rick. I'm glad you found something that works for you. But I got my thing, you got yours. And then kind of in Corinth, the deal is, and we can still do the business deal, right? Whatever our religions are. We can still make a buck. That's kind of what they're after. What are we getting at? The predominant threat for the Corinthian church from the outside wasn't even false teaching coming in, though there's some of that. Paul will address that. It seemingly wasn't either the threat of persecution, physical harm or loss for standing up for Christ, The threat that was coming to the Corinthian church was the threat of worldliness, conforming to the world, adopting the world's values, methods, acceptance, and esteem. The trouble wasn't that the church was located in Corinth. The trouble was that there was too much Corinth in the church. And that's our same same temptation we have, isn't it? I mean, it's true, you might say our culture is becoming more hostile to the Christian faith and ethic broadly, but still in the main, being a Christian is a rather comfortable existence in America, maybe especially suburban America, especially if you keep to yourself. And so instead of being opposed from the front, what is then the evil one strategy, but it's like he's digging underneath to pull out God from within, to corrupt us from the inside, that we become a shell of God's church. We become a church facade, a church front. You open the door and you look inside, there's no church there. There's no God there. What have we become? We're just the world. Don't we see this? Even many buildings, you walk around even Richmond, they have church on the building, but if you open the door, it's just the world's loves and values on the inside, but in a priest's collar. And the pressure today, and it's real, is just just get on board. And the world's telling us, hey, everybody else is getting on board. I mean, the Pope just this past, what, two weeks has blessed same-sex couples. That temptation's real today for us. And it was real in Corinth. And Paul warns them, and so warns us, by the authority of Christ, as one of the apostles, you got to be different you got to be distinct. you got to be the church of God, not the church of the world. Because that's who you are. Furthermore, you are a consecrated people. This means you're a holy people. You're a people that God looks at and He calls you holy. you got to remember this is who you are. And I want to tell you, I think this is the, the primary thing He wants before them as He opens this letter. That they know in God's eyes they are holy because of Jesus Christ. That is, before, again, Paul, and he'll get to this, he's going to come in conviction guns a-blazing. Like, you're being divisive, boom. You're you're sleeping around, boom, can't do that. You know, your views on singleness, boom, they're warped. He's going to be bringing all kinds of conviction. But before ever he can get there, he's drilling down here. But understand, in Christ, he sees you now as holy. That's their identity. I hope you understand, this is the way Christianity This is the way the gospel works. The good news for sinners has never been, you know what? You better shape up. You better measure up. You better get up to snuff. And then maybe God will like you. Maybe he'll go around and forgive you and give you heaven and peace and stuff. 
You measure up, you get good things from God. That's not the gospel. That's not good news. Because guess what? You'll never measure up enough. The gospel's good news because it's good news for sinners, for mess-ups, for Corinthian sinners, Richmond sinners, and all sinners everywhere in between, right? It's good news for the guilty. That's who we are. And actually, it's only good news for those that say that they're guilty. We need a way, as sinners, we need a way to be right before God, one that we are not ultimately responsible for. That's the gospel. And so what's the status that we have been gifted with? What's the standing in the gospel that we've been just granted, bequeathed to us, I think is the term? Holy. That's what it is. Look at verse 2. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. In the first word, that's just the verb form for made holy. You are made holy perfect in Christ Jesus, and then he adds, comma, called to be saints. And what is a saint? It's just a holy one. That's what it means, literally. And God calls you that. Here's the difference. He's calling you holy, not because you were holy of yourself. Do you see the difference we're dealing with here? You're being called a saint. You're being called holy because Jesus Christ, your Lord, is holy, not because you yourself was. This is so important because you got to get this. Your righteous, holy standing with God does not ultimately rest on how holy you are or how holy you live, but on how holy Christ is. That's what makes you holy in God's eyes. That's your status, your calling you've been favored with. Sanctified in Christ Jesus, not in everyday church attendance. And this is really important. Why? Your perfect standing before God, if it rests on Christ, guess what? It never changes. It never diminishes. Like your, your, your cell phone, you, know, you forgot to charge it last night, you look at it, the power is going down. Your holiness power never diminishes. It's always fully charged because it's not your holiness, it's Christ's given to you. And we have to keep this front and center, that this is how embraced we are, this is how affirmed we are in the gospel, so we can actually look at our sin honestly. Because if you don't have that background and you start thinking, my holiness rests ultimately on me before God, you're going to be afraid to find sin because you're going to be afraid to face up to the truth or you're going to find your sin everywhere and you're going to be like, forget it, who can do this? You got to be grounded in the gospel first. Then you can look at your sin and say, well, I don't know if I can deal with this, but I know he can. This is the difference between what we call our positional holiness. We have been united with Christ, raised with Him to the right hand of the Father. So the Father looks at us and He sees the holiness of Jesus Christ. That's our position with God, but that's not based on our personal holiness or our progressive or everyday holiness. When you come to Christ, let's be honest, you're probably not very holy. You probably don't live too obediently, but your position is already perfect with Jesus. Now, you walk your Christian life, you read the Word, you're convicted by the Spirit, you're in the fellowship of the saints, you become, hopefully, more like Jesus, but you're never getting here. But here, never changes. This grows moment by moment, day by day, stumbles probably, and we, by the Spirit's help, get back up. But here's the thing. There's a difference between our positional holiness and our progressive holiness. But where we stand with God, it's on our position. And if we get that first, that's the power, because we know that rests on grace, we know that rests on love, that's the power that will help us be motivated to become progressively more holy. And to see this illustrated, I cannot beat this illustration that was used by Martin Luther, the great reformer, and it's expounded upon by the modern theologian, Michael Reeves. So I just have to share it with you, because I couldn't beat it, I couldn't say it better than them. But the analogy is like this. Martin Luther described it. It's like the status that we receive in a marriage. 
in this example Luther uses, you got a wicked harlot who is married to a great honorable king. And so Luther develops the picture like this. He says, at the wedding, a wonderful exchange takes place whereby the king takes all the shame and debt of his bride. And the harlot receives all the wealth and royal status of her bridegroom. So think about this. Like when you got married, maybe you got married right out of college, and one of you had a bunch of college debt. Well, if your wife-to-be had a bunch of college debt, you get married, guess what? It becomes yours. Or maybe your husband purchased on credit, a really expensive sports car, and all that debt, you get married, sorry, honey, it's also yours. Or maybe you married into somebody very financially well off, and you are in poverty. But guess what? Your spouse now, all that wealth, it's shared. It's now yours. That's the kind of exchange that happens in the gospel. Michael Reeves explains it like this. He says, in the story... The prostitute then finds she's been made a queen. Now note this. That does not mean she always behaves as befits royalty. She doesn't know how, frankly. But however she behaves, her status is royal. She is now the queen. So it is with the believer. She remains a sinner and continues to stumble and wander, but she has the righteous status of her perfect and royal bridegroom. She is, and until death, will remain at the same time both utterly righteous in her status before God and a sinner in her behavior. He goes on, this means it is simply wrong-headed for the believer to look at her behavior as an accurate yardstick of her righteousness before God. Her behavior and her status, they're distinct. The prostitute will grow more queenly as she lives with the king and feels the security of his love, but she'll never be more the queen. Just so the believer becomes more Christ-like over time, but never more righteous because we're already with our king. Think about that for this church, Corinth. What do we know about them? They're filled with factions. There's some gross sexual immorality. They're prudish and self-righteous. They're abusing the Lord's table. They have a selfish focus with the spiritual gifts. This church is messed up, right? But you know what else about this church? They are holy because they're tied to Jesus Christ. That's where you have to begin. You are a consecrated people because you're tied to Jesus. Furthermore, and this is the final one, you're a community of grace. A community of grace. This is who we are. Because what he immediately tells the Corinthians, you have this vaulted status before God, but so does every other believer on the planet. This isn't just for you, it's for all in Christ. Look at verse 2. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, yes, in Corinth, but together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. What does this do? On the front end, they're so encouraged, and they should be. We should be, about who we are, what we've been gifted in Christ. But simultaneously, what's he doing also? He's saying, but don't be proud about it. This should humble us. Amen. Amen. You stand no better and no higher than any other Christian in this room. Right? The, everything is level at the foot of the cross. So you get this. The oldest, most faithful, godly Christian in this room and the newest believer who came to Christ in their seat moments ago, they have the same status in God's eyes. Holy. Saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. The most adept biblical counselor. The most struggling and tempted, struggling Christian. Equally holy because of the cross. Now think about this. That's also true about the brother 
who has offended you. This is also true about the sister who didn't really treat you right in the church. This is true also about the brother you can't really get along with too well and you don't really want to be around. God favors you no more than them. Together with all those in every place who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to know this, right? It's like what Kyle was getting at with showing us the Lord Jesus as he washes the disciples' feet. What keeps us from serving others? What keeps us from fellowshipping to others or with others? So often it's our pride. We're too important, too busy, too advanced in the Christian life to be slowed down by these less saintly folks. That's how divisions and factions start in the church, isn't it? And it was happening, happening in Corinth, for sure. But so much of that would be smothered if we just remember who we are, each and every one, because of Jesus Christ, holy, but only because of Jesus Christ. And that applies not only within these walls, but that applies as we think about those who call upon the Lord in every place. In other words, we should be humble about how we think about other Christians, too, and other churches. We should never be embittered or condescending to Christians or churches that just are not like ours. Oh, but they don't preach expositionally. Mm. Tisk tisk. Oh, they're covenantal. Oh, oh, they're seeker. They're entertainment driven. They're so showy. They're so fake. They're so big. They're so small. They're so shallow. It doesn't matter. They are saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, both their Lord and ours. We have the same Lord. We have the same status before God. We're sinners saved by grace and grace alone if they are indeed in Christ. So don't be smug or self-righteous to other Christians or speak about Christ's churches like that. They need His blood and so do we. And in that way, we're no different. Now, does that mean we ignore their faults or our own? No. I mean, Paul, he's going to get into it in this letter. But what does it come from? It comes from a spirit of humility. A posture that remembers who we are, and we're only that because of Jesus Christ. That's why as a church, we often pray for other local churches in our services, like we did just moments ago for Powhatan Christian Fellowship. Sometimes we're in strong, strong agreement with the, the theology and how they do baptism and their style of ministry. Sometimes we're maybe not in such agreement, but we're agreed on the gospel. So there are brothers and sisters, wherever they are, they're stumbling sinners just as we are who need grace, and so we pray for them because we know we need it too. And more than that, we're a community. We're family because with them, we all share the need for this same blessing that Paul gives in verse 3. We never move beyond this. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been shown that grace, but only because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And why? So we can give that to others, to those inside the church, those part of the church universal we haven't met, and those in the world, if they would come and bow before the Lord Jesus. But that's what the worship at this table is all about. The only reason that's true for us, the only reason we can be holy is because of what this represents. Jesus died for sinners like us and all of them that trust in Christ. And so let us celebrate that together as we come to the table. I'm about to pray. As I pray, I'm going to ask the men who have already been designated to come forward to distribute the elements for us. So let's pray. Father, we confess that it is true we are sinners. We confess of ourselves that we are not holy, but we confess that because of Jesus' death and His status given to us, we can and we are holy. And that's a holiness that is not changed in your eyes in the least, despite the ways we failed you. We confess we are failures, but we confess we have a greater Savior that you've given. And so as we celebrate this table, may we not forget, and may that be our confidence looking all the way to the end. We long for you, Lord Jesus, to return. You are our Lord. And it's in his name alone we pray. Amen.